if you've heard the story about the two friends walking down the street together, talking to one another. The one is very happy, and the other one looks quite down and glum. And the happy friend turns to sad friend and asks, what's going on? What is bothering you? And he says, you won't believe what has happened to me. Three weeks ago, one of my family members passed away and left me 50,000 rand. And the friend nods, okay, go on. He says, that's not all. Two weeks ago, I lost another family member that left me 100,000 rand. And the happy friend says, you sound quite blessed. He says, yeah, but last week, a friend of mine passed away and left me a quarter of a million dollars, oh, rands. And the happy friend turns to him and says, listen, I don't know why you're looking this way then. You have no reason to look sad. What's going on with you? And he looks at him and he says, you know what? This week, not a cent, nothing. And when I heard this story, I wondered what about this conversation what about this conversation speaks to something about being human? Is it that we take things for granted that come our way? Is it that we hope that someday our big break will come and when it does come, it should come well? Or is it that this story somehow speaks about this longing this yearning, this search deep inside of each one of us for more. There must be more. And that we sit with a discontentment with life as it is, and we try to find ways or people or experiences that can help us to feel more content. Contentment is that experience that I feel satisfied with life. There's a sense of fulfillment. And then obviously discontentment, the opposite of that, is this search for meaning and more. Sometimes discontentment can have the face of greed when it becomes compulsive or obsessive. It can have the face of someone or something that is owned by whatever they are searching or longing or yearning for. So please understand me this morning, I'm not talking about this natural drive that's inside of us towards a growth and a better life. I'm talking about the dark side of that search and longing. When that turns into something that takes a hold of our lives that is unhealthy and unhelpful, it starts to define us. It's no longer about the search or the growth. It's about the thing or the someone. So I become what I long for. I am my car. I am my address. I am the position that I have at work. What's interesting is in this week, a friend of mine told me about a study it's called, about, it's called the, the two-factor theory. And it's quite complex when you go into it. But the gist of the theory is that we have this idea that our happiness and our unhappiness, our contentment and our discontentment lie on one scale. And we think and we have this idea that if I can work on the things that I feel discontent about, the level of my contentment and happiness will automatically be better. It'll go up, I'll be more happier and more content. And the in interesting thing is that this theory has proven that the two actually do not share one scale. There are two separate lines and they do not influence each other as directly as we tend to think they do. And when we have this idea that they are, they are directly connected to each other, we end up living in a life where we search and long and yearn and never find anything. 
we have a sense of emptiness, an unfulfillment, a life unattainable. Thousands of years ago, there was someone who was an observer of life and how we live life and do life together by ourselves. And he wrote poems about the things that he learned from his own life and experiences with the hope that it will convey something that will be helpful to us as we go about trying to figure out how to find the place of contentment. His name was David. And today we are spending some time with one of these poems, which is called a psalm, a psalm, psalm 131. And David was a king. He had everything his heart could search for in this world. He had the money, he had the experiences, he had the power, the position, I'm sure he had a beautiful wife. He had the right connections. And David writes in this psalm and says, I've, I've gotten all these things. And I've, I've, I've been on this journey to find contentment and I found that it was not in any of these. And he gives us some clues about the roots of discontentment in his life. And I found that it's been helpful for my own. So look at verse one again with me. It's from the message paraphrase. It says, God, I'm not trying to rule the roost. I don't want to be king of the mountain. I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. I'm not trying to rule the roost. David used to uh, earlier find find spaces where he could fill his need for power and control. He thought that's where he's going to find contentment. And he says, I'm not trying to do that anymore because I realize I'm not going to find it there. He says, I don't want to be king of the mountain. And this one is one that speaks to my own life. He says, I used to think that perhaps I'll find contentment in what others say about me or think about me, the opinion of those I share my life with. That when I'm the who's who in the zoo, if I've made it in the eyes of others, I will have a sense of fulfillment. And he says, no, I didn't find it there. I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. I've had all these dreams. I've had all these plans of where I want to be and who I want to be. I've worked my way up. I'm still sitting with this yearning deep inside of me. What are the things that you could add to that verse in your own life? What are the things that take up your energy and your time and your focus in such a way that you realize, wow, this has, been, this has become such a part of who I am, my identity. For some of us, it's in our experiences. If only I can do this one thing, last thing on my bucket list, I won't feel and have the sense that I'm missing out on life. If only I can get one more medal on that shelf, my achievements, my degrees, then I'm going to have a sense of satisfaction and contentment. In this world, we will never experience complete fulfillment and contentment with these things. A theologian of our time, Karl Rahner, said, in the insufficiency of everything attainable, we eventually realize that here in this life, all symphonies remain unfinished. That's the conclusion that David came to. But he doesn't stop there. He says that, In this place, in this 
this being of mine, this longing cannot be satisfied by these things, which means that this search, this yearning must be for something more and deeper and cannot be filled with superficial things or people or experiences. It's in, embedded in my soul. Your soul is the place where all your inner functions come together, your heart, your mind, your emotions, your dreams, your plans. And he says, I found, I found the place where that root, the heart of that yearning is fulfilled and I found what I've been looking and searching for. I found the pathway to contentment. And it gives us a wonderful image to use, to grab our imagination, to help us on this pathway to contentment, to help us to experience in this life fulfillment. He gives us this image of a child with its mother. And he says that like a baby in the arms of its mother, a content baby, some translations, a baby that has just been fed, that has just been nourished. So my soul is a baby content. Have you seen a baby with its mother just after it has been fed? A few weeks ago, friends came to visit and they just had twins. And to see that, the dynamics in that space where this baby realizes it's hungry. I rock rivulrug, the edgy, it's the atmosphere, everything, the energy in that house changes and everyone knows it. This baby wants food and it wants it, he wants it now. And when that, that mother takes that baby and looks at him, holds him, you see the love, he's like, Let's get on with this. And she puts him on her lap. She starts feeding him, giving, giving him his milk. And you sense the energy, the satisfaction, the fullness, the fulfillment enter into that room as that baby eats. And after he's fed, that face, those eyes, only eyes for his mother, the one that just cared and nourished for him, provided for him. That loving gaze between baby and mother, at peace, content. David says, this is the metaphor, this is the image, this is the invitation, this is the way be like a baby in the arms of God. Turn towards him. Look at God. He is the source. That longing, that yearning, that vacuum of your soul was created by God for God. He is the one that can satisfy. Augustine, a church father, said, our hearts are restless until they find its rest in you, God. Jesus called it a, a hunger and a thirst in Matthew 5. And he says, this hunger and thirst, if it is directed to what is righteous, what is good, what is godly, if it is directed towards God, you will be satisfied. It's such a practical invitation when we follow God. Because every morning when I wake up and I feel that my anxiety level is quite heightened because I'm thinking of all these happiness programs of, uh, programs of contentment that I need to fulfill and go and be, and then it's an invitation to turn to God, to acknowledge, to say, Lord, you are the source I acknowledge that you've created this space in my being, in my soul, because it is, 
it is for you and you alone. And when you find him there, nothing else compares. You realize that everything you've been searching for is found in him. As you turn to God, as that baby turns to their mother, the mother takes them and starts feeding them. They, they receive food. So the invitation for us is to receive, receive the food. What is feeding your life at the moment? And if you are in the arms of the loving God, what should feed your life? I love the metaphors of the scriptures. Because David uses here this image of a baby drinking, eating milk. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, speaks about the word of God also in this way. And he says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And that spiritual milk is the words of our loving God. It's scripture. Find the milk, find the food, start eating. Spend time with it, read it. Start with the first, first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, which tell, tells us the story of Jesus, the one that we follow. Look at his life. Read his sayings. What did he say about this type of life that we are searching for? What did he say about money and achievements and power? Whether it is once a week, twice a week, three times a week, start eating. Get the food in your system. And then that, that moment when you realize that this baby is, is getting full, satisfied. Get satisfied on the food that you are busy eating. Allow it to nourish you. How? Meditate on the word. How do you meditate on scripture? You stay with what you just read. Ponder the words, the ideas, the phrases, the images that catch your attention. Don't just throw it away and go on and read the next thing. Linger there, ponder it. Maybe there's something that sparks a memory of something that happened long ago or recently. Hold that. Spend time with it. See how it is feeding your life and your soul. And then this baby resting in the arms of the mother, content. Resting in the arms of God. Being, just being with the loving provider. And to just be and to rest in God means, Lord, I'm not going to take up my energy and time worrying about what I'm going to control next and how I'm going to control everything next because I know you are in control. I'm not going to be preoccupied with what people say about me or think about me or their opinions because your opinion is that I am your child and I am loved by you. I'm not going to, to share my attention and energy with things that I still need to figure out. Here I just need to be. Because you are the one that cares. You are almighty. You are all wonderful. You are all providing. You are all caring. You are all present. And I can own that. I can receive that. This is a message of hope. It's a message of hope, and that is why David ends the song with, wait, Israel, for God. Wait with hope. Hope now and hope always. Wait, Melissa, with hope. Wait, Peter, with hope. Wait, Renee, with hope. Now and always. Because we serve and follow a God of hope. 
I don't know what the invitation is for you this morning. Maybe you're sitting here and you realize that I've been preoccupied with all the yearnings of my soul, but I've been directing them to many, many things. And they're taking a space up in my life that I don't feel is free. I'm bound by it. Maybe you've, you've come to realize that I need to go and discern what of these, these desires and yearnings of, of my heart are desires that actually they go over into coveting things. I'm becoming the things that I'm longing and searching for. Or maybe you are here and you realize that the source the one that I've been looking for, I know, I know that I can find it in him. I've just not been in contact with this longing for a while. It doesn't matter where you are today. The invitation for each one, each and every one of us is turn to God. Turn to those loving arms. Receive the food. Let it nourish you. Let it stay with you. Let it feed you. And rest in, in the one that is enough. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you know us, each and every part of us. And that you long to enter each and every part of our lives, of our dreams, of our plans, of our hopes. Thank you that there's a space created inside of us that is especially for you. And that we can, can look forward with hope to a life where we feel a sense of fulfillment and contentment. And Lord, help us in that. Help us to turn towards you when, when life happens, in the busyness, in the in the hustle and bustle of working it out and getting our things in order. Help us when we forget about you. We turn our lives to you, Lord. We want to find this place with you. Thank you that everything you give and have for us is always enough. We can trust in that. We can ho have hope in that. And we trust for you to provide. I pray for every person here today that has a sense of anxiety or worry about what's next. When is enough enough? Where are you, God? I pray that you will come and quiet our hearts and our souls. That we can rest and trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you need prayer or want to speak to anyone today, you're welcome to join our team in the chapel, the Klipkerk. Um, after the service, we have some of our medewerkers and leaders there. And if you're here for the first time or you've been coming for a while, but you have some questions about um, stuff happening in church, uh, What's Mosaic about? We have our Connect team in the foyer. They are waiting to have a coffee with you and have a conversation with you. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Enjoy your week.